Well, hello, friends. Welcome again to That's the Tea Book Reviews. I'm your co-host, Angela. And I'm Emily. And we review books and drink tea while holding cats occasionally on Angela's part. <laughs> while sometimes holding cats. Yes. So just to introduce ourselves a little bit further, I am, and to just in case you're wondering why we are reviewing books in the first place and who are we to say what not, uh, I am a uh, currently pursuing a Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Writing. I do have a um, undergraduate degree in writing. Um, I also am an artist and I illustrate book covers. You can find my website at AngelaMerkelArt.com. And uh, that's just a little bit about me. Uh, and I am a self-published author. I have published three books now. And you can find them either on Amazon or my website, thistleboundbooks.wixsite.com slash Watson. I also have a uh, Western short story that's available for a free download on the website. So, And you can find Emily's books on Amazon. Yes. Emily G. Watson is yes. the author name. And again, we'll put all those links in the description so you can find yes, us. Yes, we will. So the book we are talking about today is called Mark of the Raven by Morgan L. Busse. And Morgan, in case you ever find this video and I'm mispronouncing your last name, I apologize. It looks like Busse to me, like maybe French or something. We're but trying. if it's not, please, please forgive us. But before we get into it, Emily, what kind of tea are you drinking today? I am back to drinking a uh, good old Tetley today in my Bucky's mug. I just needed some Back in the Bucky's mug. Good. Well, that's like the only mug I have with me right now because everything else is in storage. So, uh, yeah. Well, I, I just, need to get you a new mug. I do need to get a new mug. You're right. What are you drinking? I am drinking ginger tea. And this is a cup... A mug from the Creation Museum in Kentucky. It's got all kinds of dinosaurs on it, and it has all the names of the dinosaurs beside them. Did you get that when we were visiting there? Yeah, I did. I, I did. I had trouble remembering. I know you got that cool book, but I yes, I got two mugs. I got one at the Creation Museum, this one that has dinosaurs, and then I got one at the Ark Encounter. That's right. That is like. A thick ceramic brown one that's if cool. you've never been to the creation museum or the ark encounter angela and i both highly recommend it i think they were some of the most aesthetically beautiful museums i've ever been in in addition to having really good information well presented and all that oh yeah so. it's excellent it's also a great place for kids neither of us have kids but um they specifically have everything they have playgrounds they have splash pads they have zip lines you can make a whole day out of the museum trip and they intentionally make it fun for kids oh, yeah. and adults so great place to take your family oh yeah my family would never have found me again if they took me there as a child <laughs> i would have gotten lost well, in the wasn't ar somewhere it, it wasn't around when we were kids unfortunately. i know i'm saying if they had <laughs> if i was a child that I would have gotten lost in the ark somewhere, hoping to be on a voyage somewhere. Yes, I would still like to take my niece someday, if that works out. I could see you taking Alexa. Oh, yeah. So anyways, um, the book we're talking about today is in the emerging Christian fantasy genre, um, which really just means it is normal fantasy written by a Christian author and has like Christian themes in it. It is not strictly allegorical in any way. It's more just um, kind of along the lines, I would say like Tolkien wasn't strictly allegorical either, but he had inspiration from his faith. So um, similar. And disclaimer, several of the books that I recommended are in this genre. So I hope you like listening about <laughs> those books. So let's start with um, the, the things of the book, that- probably. Yes, yes, thank you. Why don't you read the back of the book for us today, since I did it last time. Oh, you don't have it. Never mind. Yeah. You have the ebook. I have the ebook, uh, so I could read the description that's listed on Amazon, but why don't you go ahead and read yes, the back of the book that I you have, have in front of you. physical book in my hands, because I am that person who buys physical books. I also do not own a Kindle, so there you go. I sometimes right. do that because it's cheaper. If oh, I it, like it's it, definitely cheaper. if I like it, I'll go buy a hard copy and I have like a list of hard copies that I do want to buy. But sometimes <laughs> if I'm not sure if I'll like it or not, then I'll just like buy the ebook first to test it out because it's cheaper. Oh, absolutely. There's no problem with either form. Both are good. All right. Here is the um, synopsis on the back of the book. 
Lady Celine is heir to House Ravenwood and the secret family gift of dreamwalking. As a dreamwalker, she can enter a person's dreams and manipulate their greatest fears or desires. Soon after the gifting, however, Celine discovers that the Ravenwood women have been secretly using their gift to gather information or to assassinate those responsible for the fall of House Ravenwood to the Dominia Empire hundreds of years ago. As she becomes more entrenched in Ravenwood's dark past, Celine longs to find out the true reason behind her family's gift, believing that its original intent could not have been for such evil purposes, but she is torn about upholding her family's legacy, a legacy that supports her people. Celine's dilemma comes to a head when she is tasked with assassinating the one man who can bring peace to the nations, but who is also prophesied to bring about the don downfall of her own house. One path holds glory and power and will solidify her position as Lady of Ravenwood. The other path holds shame and likely death. Which will she choose? And is she willing to pay the price for the path chosen? So right out the gate, you could tell, ooh, this is serious. <laughs> yes. This is very serious stuff going on here. I will say, um, poor Angela, she made all these book recommendations and I ended up like not liking any of the books. But um, this book, it was well written. I will say that there's, it's not that she's not a great writer. I just personally didn't enjoy the book because of that dark aspect. It's very dark. And there is no moment of levity or hope really throughout the entire book. Yeah, well... So I'm speaking to someone who's read the entire series. It's a right. trilogy. This is the first book. And she did start with the darkest one, I guess, because of the situation that the main character begins in. This is the darkest of the three books. Um, after that, she, well, I don't, I don't want to give you spoilers, but it, it does get better. <laughs> it, her situation changes and, you know, based on the choices that she makes and it does get better. So yes, it is it is um, a darker fantasy story. Um, however, I would add that it is clean, um, mm -hmm. unlike yeah. you know something like Game of Thrones or something. There's no sexual content. There's um, no cursing. There's not excessive violence. Even um, it's more just like the creepy aspect and sad sort of because she is going into people's dreams with her magical gift and like seeing their nightmares and manipulating their nightmares and you know seeing like tragic things that happened in their past and making them relive them so you know that's that's all fun but again it is in fact clean fit clean fantasy that what i would call and I would also argue that I think it does have a message of hope because the main character is trying to get out of her situation. She is looking for a different way. And what I really loved about the deeper meaning of this was it's basically kind of if you have always been trapped in an abusive family or just generational legacy of bad things, this is the one person who stands up I mean, she has to work her way through it because she doesn't realize at first that it's that bad, but she's fighting it. The whole book, she's fighting against herself and against her family's expectations, and she finally has to decide, I'm going to be different and break that cycle. And I think that would resonate with a lot of people. Yeah. And again, it I don't necessarily think that anything in it is, I don't want to use the word inappropriate, but... It's just really dark in tone, and if you're okay with that, then it's probably perfectly fine. I just personally don't like reading stuff that, that that's that dark, and that's a personal thing on my end. Yeah. Emily likes lighter-hearted things. Yeah. The world is hard enough without having to read <laughs> about it in my entertainment. But, yeah. I mean, the, the book was well-written, and the characters are well-written. I just, I disagree with you that she is, like, actively trying to change her situation she has like no agency until the very end well she has to figure out i mean she, she's struggling the whole time it's not like she's fine with it she is from struggling the, the whole time but the solution is obvious <laughs> well to you and me but when you're when i mean she's a young woman i can't remember how old she is she's you know barely it barely 20 maybe but um and if this is all you've ever known, she has nowhere else to go. No other way of supporting herself. I mean, it's easy to say, just get up and walk out when you're on the outside. Yeah. But when you, this is your situation and it's all you've ever known, that's 
a lot harder. If somebody has always been in an abusive family or an abusive relationship, it's really difficult for them to realize I can just get up and walk out. That's that, true. That yeah. is a very tough thing to come to and then to do it. So I think it was a realistic struggle. That's fair. That's fair. And there's uh, one thing actually that we've been learning in one of my MFA classes was about different like theories of why we write literature. And there's one that goes all the way back to Aristotle. He had a theory of tragedy. And that was that for some people, it is actually somewhat healing to watch fictional tragedy out on the stage. He was talking about ancient Greeks. You know, they had mm -hmm. the stage was their main source of um, fiction. To, to watch it play out in a safe environment on in fiction and then instead of having to live through those emotions yourself, he, his idea was that it can be cleansing. It's a kind of catharsis to watch that play out where you're not directly involved and it's not even real. And then you leave feeling a little bit lighter. And lots of people have disagreed with his theory over the millennia, but it has nevertheless persisted to this day. Well, and there's like nothing that's wrong why. with enjoying a tragedy. There's a lot of people that want to relate more to the emotions of a story. And they enjoy the realism of emotions and the tension that they create. That's just a personal thing on my end that those emotions are already out there in the world. And I don't need to be <laughs> feeling them when I'm trying to relax and be entertained. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I guess it depends, yeah, what you're looking for from a yeah. book, right? Again, yeah. very well written. The world building was really creative mm -hmm. the, with the idea of the different kingdoms and each of them kind of having a different gift, I guess as they call them, uh, representing different elements or things in the world and um, kind of the mysterious okay, what, what is the reason behind these gifts? And that's what the main character, she's like, we can't just be using this for assassination. Like there has yeah. to be another reason behind this. And so <laughs> she is, that is one of the things she's doing is actively trying to research the origins of all this. Yeah. To kind of understand the, you know, kind of the, the old, age old adage of you're given a gift for a reason. So what is the reason behind it? And another um, thing that I found really weird and maybe it's just me, it was the concept of how consorts are treated throughout the book. Mm -hmm. The idea of all these heads of households and mm -hmm. they're married and then their spouse is treated as like a second class citizen who can't even walk <laughs> beside them when they're in public. They have to walk behind them the whole time. Yeah. And the, the heads of the households can flirt together even though they're not, you know, necessarily married, but while well, their consort is standing right behind them. Well, that was Celine's mob was like that. Well, Not no, all of that the heads was of also the, the girl from the, the 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 fire kingdom with the dragons, and she's like flirting with other guys while her consort is standing behind her in the background. <laughs> oh, was she? Yeah, I don't remember. Well, that. Well, not necessarily like all right out flirting, but joking around with them. Well, yeah, in conversation. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure she probably based that on <laughs> somehow some kingdoms operated. Yeah. Not to say that some kingdoms haven't operated like that, but it was just like, yeah. <laughs> I guess for me, it's like, why would you let yourself get into a marriage like that? Like, <laughs> well, that is not I don't worth know. anything. <laughs> you know, some people want power, I guess. It's some not people like want they got the... any power, though. No, but, but I they mean, for most of had history, an easy life. For most of history, marriage was, and you know, that's part of the, the struggles in the book is as she is of a marrying age and all the other characters are, you know, a lot of the other characters are too. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a, to be able to marry for love is a privilege. Mm -hmm. And thankfully that's, you know, something we have the privilege of having in a modern time. But for most of history, yeah. marriage, especially in a royalty or a nobility, it was a economic or a political right. transaction. It was an and, advantage. You yeah. try to make an advantageous match. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, just to be able to provide for yourself or to unite kingdoms so that they would stop going to war and killing each other. Yeah. And it's just, it's really sad when you think about how that's how marriage was treated it was more of a contract throughout history. And that's yeah. kind of the struggle of a lot of these characters of, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I don't want that to be what my right. marriage looks like, you know, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. maybe we don't all get to marry for love. And that's like the, 
right. one of the, the recurring ideas too in the book. Yeah. So we haven't mentioned yet. There's another main character named Lord Damien. He is um, the head of a different house, um, and his house does water powers, has water powers. Um, and he is kind of representative of basically a Christian. Um, in this world, he's a follower of the light is what they call it. That, that's what they call God in this world. And one thing that I really liked was when Celine would walk in dreams, she would sometimes find a representation of a person's soul. Yeah, like their And essence. usually... Yeah, their essence. And usually what she found, it was dark and twisted and tortured. But when she went into Damien's dreams, she found this luminous ball of light. And that was the first time she had ever encountered something like that. And she got very curious about what could make a person's soul that bright and that clean. Mm -hmm. And as the series goes on, she discovers, you know, about the, the light and um, God, basically. And learns how to trust him but that i thought that was a good like depiction of what a soul who has been changed by the holy spirit looks like mm -hmm. kind of how it's different than it was before and it should be different mm -hmm. and it should be different yeah yeah if it you know the thing the sad thing is a lot of the other kingdoms or heads of the houses would claim to be all self-righteous and stuff like that stand for what is good but you find out throughout the book that there's not a one of them that doesn't have some kind of blood on their hands. Yeah. With the exception of Damien. With he the actually exception is... of Damien. But yeah. Which is like... He's actually a very good character. Yeah. He's like, he's like the exception here amongst all these politicians, so to speak, who have their hands dirty in one way or another. And he's like the one clean person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's, you know, there to, he comes to Castle Ravenwood along with the other leaders to, like, have some discussions and whatever. And um, one of the other houses is trying to marry him off to one of their, like, their younger sister. But the thing is, that younger sister was in love with his younger brother who passed. So neither of them really want that. Yeah. Because she, you know, she's like, you're not the brother I was in love with. So... I mean, so that is in both of their minds, but it's still like, uh, we might have to do this, but neither of them really And they're very to. nice to each other. They clearly nice care for each other, but it's yeah. not a romantic kind of love. And they're both right. in agreement that they're not in a romantic kind of love, but yeah. maybe it would be better for the kingdoms if they were buried and they're one yeah. of the things they're yeah. struggling with. Right. So that's another thing. So it is, um, I, I would say somewhat of a romance uh, but it, it's just starting in this yeah. book they they you know just encounter each other so it picks up a lot more in the next two books but um and i really enjoyed the love story aspect of it at least as the series goes on i thought it was well done so the i guess the other thing i'll say about this book for me personally it was a page turner I thought she was very good at keeping the action going and keeping you wondering, well, what's going to happen? How is she going to get out of this? So I read this book in two days because I could not put it down. I think I read it pretty much all in one day, except for the very first chapter, just because that's how I read. I'm a binge <laughs> reader. Mm. There was not much else to do all day. So. But it was easy to binge read, wasn't it? Yeah. Because, because it was... Um, just the way it was written. Yeah, again, it's intriguing. You do mm -hmm. want to know what happens next, and you do want to, you know, see how they're all going to get out of this horrible, horrible situation that everybody's digging themselves into. But um, in the end, it's like there was no moment of levity, even, of relief from the serious tone at any moment. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. So yeah, it just depends um, what your preference is, what kind of books you like to read. Um, if you are okay with like a, a more serious fantasy tone, then you might like this book. If you need something that's maybe not quite so serious, then maybe not. Yeah. Again, well written. And if you're into that genre, you'd probably really love it. I just personally found it a little dark. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But this author has lots of other books, too. Um, I have read the first of her Daughter of Light series, um, and that one was actually her debut novel. So this one, I think, is actually written much better than the first series she did, of course. 
but that one may not have been as dark. I think this was just one that she wanted to do <laughs> like that. Again, some people really enjoy books that are of a darker nature, you know, and they're perfectly mm -hmm. fine with that. Yeah, a lot of people do. I mean, they keep writing them, so. <laughs> yeah, they keep writing them. They keep a lot of selling like for some reason. They keep selling. <laughs> oh. I, uh, I don't know. I think it's good that this one was like that, but also in the Christian genre. Yeah. So maybe some people. Well, I know that assassin literature as a whole is really, really popular. Yeah, that's true. So I thought well, it maybe was, some people it might read this. that it was like a Christian take on the assassin genre where, yeah. you know, they glorify the assassin genre in the secular world mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and crime, you know, crime <clears throat> fiction that glorifies the criminal. That's true. And this is kind of turning it it's on its head and showing, no, this is just how wrong the whole idea of the assassin literature is. <laughs> yeah, that's true. At least in making it seem like it's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. So that, I, I thought that was a very interesting, unique twist was the taking the assassin literature through a Christian lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think she did that really well. And also as a cover artist, I want to mention this cover is really good. It's really cool. Yeah, well, we'll have really it in, pretty, the, in uh, the video, of course. Um, it says cover designed by Kirk Dupont. I, if that's how you say your name. Uh, good job. Good job, Kirk. I'm impressed. <laughs> yeah, the cover design is really beautiful. Yeah. It's got like a castle in the background and it has Celine with her twin swords and her like black assassin gear. She's like looking over her shoulder. And in in the subsequent book covers, she's more facing the camera. This one, she's kind of like looking back over her shoulder, like she's looking if anybody's coming or whatever. In the next ones, she's more open and like facing toward the camera. So I think it's symbolic of her character development. Right, her kind of coming out of her shell because she mm -hmm. she's struggling so much that she really locks herself up emotionally yes so she, she does doesn't have to deal with it right and i think that is also very realistic it's a mm -hmm. coping mechanism that a lot of people might employ if you're in tough situations and especially you know she was having to see everybody's fears and stuff and and she didn't know how to handle that because she could see their deepest, darkest fears right there in front of her eyes. And so to protect herself, she would seal herself away emotionally, which, of course, is not healthy, but no, you can understand why she's doing it. It's a very realistic response to all that. Yeah. Um, the human brain, I think uh, Pastor Mark has talked about it before, that the human mind is only made to withstand so much negative information, which is why in the modern world today, when we have access to so much news and so much information about what is happening all around the world and all the horrible things and it's not healthy to i mean it's one thing to know that those things happen but it's another thing to constantly immerse and dwell in negative information right because it's just not healthy but again right. celine doesn't have a choice right mm -hmm. and um so, so to it's, protect it's, herself, a, yeah. it's an understandable reaction as she's just trying to survive and she's trying to avoid processing any of it because she can't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Especially if she's just a young woman. Yeah. So that's a lot to ask. <laughs> oh, yeah. But I, I think the, the saving grace in the book is Damien, really, because he's such a good man. Yeah. And brings brings like this level of hope that Celine comes to be very curious about, which is good. Yeah. So yeah, that's our assessment. Um, you you know decide for yourself if this is the type of book you would like to read. Um, it is definitely very, like we said, compelling. So you may not be able to put it down once you start it. And let us know if you do read it. Let us know what you think in the comments. Yeah, are you typically into uh, darker themed literature, or I guess a better way to say it, what is your go to genre of choice? typically um and what kinds of books do you like to read so until next time read books and drink tea